Now all the stuff I've been saying about the integration process being anti-God and the worst kind of morality there is worst kind of immorality there is is a morality divorced from God we have quite a lot of proof of that in fact we have so much proof we don't even know that's what it is your first proof is human history itself and your second proof are the religious writings pick almost any religion you want the religious writings are all pretty much insane if you stop to think about what they're saying if you've been taught however and programmed since a child that those words are holy you won't actually be able to read them or you won't read them when you're able and that truth too is prodigiously illustrated in history so here's a little experiment Go pick up <clears throat> any religious book you want, other than the Bible. Go pick up the Talmud. Go pick up the Church Father writings. Go pick up the Bhagavad Gita. Go pick up the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Go pick up the Rig Vedas. anything that's represented as you know holy the people drool over and call it from God except for the Bible just just everything else but notice how self-serving how I don't want to call it silly how petty how petty fogging all those writings are some of the most disgusting words that have ever been written in human history are in the Talmud and in the church fathers they're really two sides of a coin the Talmud is the Jewish flavor of being a jackass and the church fathers is the Christian version of being a jackass and yet so many people say, oh, but those are holy writings. Those are the sages. Really? Have you actually read the words written? Are you really sure you want to compliment those words? Now, I try to avoid castigating the Talmud, although I've done it because I have to. Mainly because there's so much richer material in the church fathers and it's really easily available because the Catholics are so stupid they don't realize they're parading their own idiocy by preserving that stuff of course the Jews don't realize how they're parading the idiocy of the Talmudic writers either in the Talmud it's supposed to be a whole lot of rabbis in the first and second centuries AD sometimes a century earlier sometimes a century later and because that's tradition and we're preserving it, they must be wise and important. Have you ever read what they actually say? Their own words. The Midrash. Have you read that too? Have you actually read Rambam? Or the other so-called sages? Have you ever actually listened to them talk? They're jerks. Every one of them. They're so damn stupid, it's not even, it's pathetic. Have you ever read Josephus? The guy's a self-serving jerk. So why don't we admit that? Only two reasons. We can't tell what jerks they are when we read them. Or we're afraid to admit it. 
I find it really difficult to believe that people are so bad at reading that they can't read that stuff and know how crappy it is. So the only thing I'm left with is that they don't want to admit it because, oh, somebody praises it who's got a couple of initials after his name who himself is either lying or unable to read. The same thing with the church fathers. They all, the whole lot of them, all of them, all the religions and all the holy books and all that other stuff except for Bibles, you just throw it away and people who won't do that are being disingenuous or they can't read. Because the Talmud never gets the Bible right. Never. Everything in it is a garbled version at best and stupid and silly and they make up whatever they want and then they slap God's name on it and the church fathers same damn thing the book of the Quran it's actually a satire on the Bible same with the book of Mormon and anybody believing even one word in those books you need to check yourself into a mental hospital Bible says there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Book of Mormon says, I think it's in 2 Nephi somewhere, it's around 2 Nephi 20 maybe. There's no other name given among men whereby we might be saved. Might. I wrote a webpage on it in satstrat.htm. Book of Mormon link. I took the two texts and compared them. Book of Mormon is a satire on the Bible. If you're a Mormon, I'm sorry, you're too dumb to live. Just go shoot yourself now. But you're probably a Mormon because your mommy and your daddy were. Or because Mormons sound nice, so you want to sound nice too. Which means you don't know anything. You're not actually doing your due diligence. You're not paying attention to what the doctrines are. It just sounds nice, and that's all you care to, to analyze. You're not analyzing it, so then you're a liar. You can't speak for what the truth is, because you didn't even test it. Same for any Christian and any Jew. Do you actually know what the Bible says? No. So then why do you call yourself a Christian? Why do you call yourself a Jew? Do you actually know the difference between Scripture and, say, the Talmud or the Midrash? No, you don't. Because if you did, you'd realize that both of those books, Talmud and Midrash, are total, what do you want to call it? They spit on the Bible. Talk about Torah. You wouldn't know the Torah if it bit you. And yet we let these people go on year after year, bowing before them. Oh, they're the sages. No, they're not. Their sagacity is zero. But the Christians are no better. Oh, the church fathers were holy. No, they're not. They were liars. The biggest liars you'd ever want to meet are all recorded down there for you. I just only hope that it's not their real names. I hope there was no real Justin Martyr. Because what he was was a jackass, an anti-Semitic jackass. I hope there was no real Eusebius, which in Greek means spiritual life. He didn't have a spiritual life. All he ever knew how to do was lie. Everything in his book, everything he wrote was one great big lie. And anybody respecting him deserves to be shot for being a liar. Or too stupid to read. Take your pick. Go read them yourself. Because people too dumb to live keep on preserving those writings. And you know why they do that? Because they think those writings are good. They honestly think, either because they're way too dumb to live, or they're way too cagey, they're preserving, the, well, if we preserve those writings, they're old, so they must be holy, and we'll slap Jew on it, and we'll slap God on it, and that makes it holy and good, and then we'll just keep aping the errors and the lies every century, and nobody will know the difference. Yeah, and nobody does. It's really shameful, our past. Truly and utterly shameful. Go read the Talmud yourself. 
You can get it for free online now. I've already put a bunch of, you know, all my Jewish, my, my Jewish videos. Just search on Brain Out or Brain Outy and Talmud. You'll come up with the videos and the links in the video descriptions are to the Talmud online. You can go read it yourself or just Google on Talmud online or just Google on Midrash online. Go read it or Google on Church Fathers or go look them up. Just Google on Shaf, S-H-A, I think it's S-H-A-A-F, the C-C-E-L dot org. Just Google on Church Fathers. Or go to earlychristianwritings.com and read them there. Read their own words yourself and then you'll know. And then you'll know something bigger. That people like the lie. The integration process is that you integrate with the lie or with the truth. And whichever one you integrate with, that's what you're going to come to love. And that's what you're going to come to die for. Now, I got a choice, and you got a choice. I got the rest of today. And it's now, what, maybe 6, 7 o'clock p.m., thank God. This day will soon be over, and it will never come back again. I never have to live this day on this earth again. It's gone. And one day will be my last day, and I wish it was now, but it's not. Why? Because there's another day to maybe learn Bible doctrine. That's Hebrews 3. So today, what do you want to do? Learn God or learn the world? Because whichever you choose to learn, that's what you'll choose to love. And that's how you'll die. And the bad news about choosing the lie is that you learn not to know that it's a lie. Because you learn to love it, you're going to call it true, and you can no longer tell it's a lie. And all those people busy telling you that the Talmud is written by the sages, and the church fathers are holy, and all those people busy telling you the Quran is the word of Allah, yeah, Allah is the best deceiver. That's actually a verse in the Quran. Allah is the best liar. Makr in Arabic. It means to be a deceiver. It means to deliberately deceive somebody. So then who's Allah? More like the devil, don't you think? And that's what Surah 114, the last Surah in the Quran, says. Don't take my word for it. Go ask a former Muslim. That's one of the reasons why many of them are former Muslims. Because they realized that the whole purpose of the Quran was to pull the wool over your eyes. Because Allah really is the best deceiver. But the people who believe in the Quran don't know that. See, if you believe in a lie, you're going to call it the truth. If you're going to call it the truth, then you can't discern when it's not the truth. And all those Mormons, how many Mormons are there out there? Or Baha'i, or Shinto, all those American Indian religions, the Wicca people, they all want to call their version true. So then they can't tell how it's not true. The atheist wants to call his version true. So then he can't tell how it's not true. The smartest thing you can be and, you know, you're going to have to constantly audit this. Is an agnostic or a believer in the Bible. Believer in the God of the Bible. And in either case, you're constantly having to ask yourself if what you believe is true. You're constantly enjoined by the Bible to audit your beliefs. Because whatever you believe is true, even if what you believe is correct, it's not correct enough. And since it's not correct enough, then that means you're believing something incorrectly. Okay, so let's find out what the incorrectness is and fix it. Keep on fixing your faith like you fix a broken window. You've got to wash your hands a lot during the day. So wash your beliefs too. 
Now, the people who aren't agnostics, and it's true, a lot of agnostics hide in agnosticism, but so do a lot of Christians hide in Christianity. If you're not agnostic and you're not a believer in the God of the Bible, and the Bible itself, and you're not, if you're not learning it in the original Hebrew and Greek, sorry. Because those were his words. If you're not one of, in one of those groups, then you're going to be real adamant about what you believe and all proud of what you believe. And trying to sell what you believe to somebody else. Well, if you're trying to sell it, honey, then you don't really believe it that much yourself. So then how true is it? You don't have to sell the truth. Explain it, yes. Understand it, yes. Audit it, yes. Evaluate it, yes. And that's a constant thing. But sell it? No. Nor do you need anybody to agree with you. If it's true, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Because it is or it is not true all by itself. Truth does not need corroboration. Lies do. Corroboration of lies makes masks itself as truth. So then you'll be less inclined. If everybody says the same thing, you'll be less inclined to investigate. So that's what hell is. Everybody's saying the same thing. Yeah, and they're all in hell too. They want what they want to be true, and what they want, what our religion enjoins upon you, is that you must do good, you must be good, you must have self-worth, you must beget something, you must deserve something. Yeah, and look what they beget and they deserve. Okay. God doesn't Strictly speaking, this is his big point anyway. He doesn't deserve anything. He didn't do anything to make himself God. Satan thinks he's going to make himself God. But God just always was, so there's no such thing as making yourself God. God can make something out of you, though. But if God didn't make himself God, then hello, you can't. You can't make Christ Lord, and anybody who argues, you know, Lordship salvation, just throw them away. They're too dumb to live. If God didn't make himself God, then you can't. And you can't make yourself worthy either. God did not make himself God. God did not make himself worthy. God just always was. He can unmake himself, but that's it. He is what he is because he chooses to keep on being that way, and he can choose to be something else, but he didn't create himself. So how are you going to create yourself into anything at all? Oh, but the people in hell want to say that. Oh, yeah, I created myself. I'm a self-made man. Really? And that brought you exactly what? Self-made what? What did yourself make? Strictly speaking, the only thing you know how to make is water and doo-doo. That's the only thing that's intrinsically coming from you yourself. Water and doo-doo. Everything else, somehow, somebody else had a hand in it. The only thing that you do alone, yourself, is water and doo-doo. Everything else is influenced and, and bought by. One or more other individuals, especially God. You turn on your shower in the morning. Your ability to turn that shower on is a product of your genes. Your genes are a product of all kinds of progenitors. 
the shower itself is a product of a whole bunch of other people working on it to make it. You bought it. And if you made it yourself, what'd you make it out of? Parts. And where'd you get those parts? Bought them in a store? You didn't make the shower you turn on in the morning from the, what do you want to call it? The constituent dust. You didn't turn the atoms into metal. You didn't turn the atoms into concrete. You didn't mold it, you didn't shape it, you didn't do it from the get-go. Somebody else did that. You bought what they did. So it's not your work. There's nothing you do except pee and defecate that is truly your own. I have to imagine that's why God invented both. To remind us, hi, this is what you do, is doo-doo. And guess what? You don't have to be ashamed of that. I created your ability to do that. And every other ability you got, I created. So I'm not ashamed of what I created. And you don't have to be ashamed of what you are either. That's God's happy message out of what the weakness we are. Oh, but we can't stand that. We gotta, we gotta take somebody else's work and claim it's our own. And we gotta take our values and say that they're God's values so that we can feel proud of ourselves. Even to the point of taking a silly Talmud and a silly set of church fathers, which at best are silly and at worst are so pettifoggingly ugly that you just want to throw up your hands and never be a Jew or a Christian or anything else again. And I don't just mean those two. I mean, pick up any religious book. Anybody who's Muslim has not read the Quran or doesn't know how to read it. The best antidote against being is against Islam is to actually read the Quran. So why is the Bible so different? Well, when you read it, you'll know. It's a world of difference between the Bible and every other holy book. They're not holy books. They're just like, I don't know, garbage. That's how I learned who God was. I looked up at the ceiling when I was 13. I said, which God are you? I would already believed in him as a kid but forgot about it or suddenly wasn't sure. Needed to audit. And I started reading all the holy books. And I started discarding them one after the next. I thought, this is silly. The same thing is true for all the so-called wannabe books of the Bible. You know, the Apocrypha and that Barnstone book that laughingly calls itself the other Bible. If you actually read stuff like the Hermas and the so-called Gospel of James and, and the Incarnation Gospel, the Infancy Gospel and the Gospel of Peter and all those other lies, if you read them, they're like Mad Magazine. Or Saturday Night Live. There's nothing remotely holy about them. And it's real obvious from the get-go. Same thing is true for the Quran or the Book of Mormon. It's brilliant satire. All those books are brilliant satire. Really brilliant. I mean, you know, you could argue that Demon actually was, was the genius behind them. Because I don't know any humans that are that smart. But it's certainly not scriptural. And just read any single Bible book and look up the ceiling and say, if you're there, God, did you actually commission this book to be written? And when you're reading any verse, especially if you already believed in Christ, say to God, is this, is this your, are these your words? Or did the translator screw it up? Or did the copyist screw it up? He'll let you know. It might not be right away. He lets you know, but he'll let you know if you want to know. Well, then you've got proof of contact with him, don't you? Yeah, that's why the book was designed to be written. Not as some holy shrine thing that you kiss, you know, at shul on Saturday when the when the rabbi parades around, not necessarily him, but his acolyte, parades the scroll around 
and then everybody, you know, he, he brings it close to you, and then you kiss your fingers, your index finger and your middle finger, ha ha. You kiss them both, and then you touch the scroll with it. Yeah, but you never learn the words inside the scroll. Is that what believing in the Torah is supposed to mean? See, the hypocrisy is extreme, and you learn to love it. And therefore, you learn to not be able to tell that what you're loving is a lie. And you fall so much in love with it, you stay in love with it, even when you're in hell. Now, as I said in the last increment, the world is doing this. I'm sorry it took me so long to get to the same place. It looks like the way God has designed time. He knows how long it takes us to get to the place where we start to realize as a group, as a group of humans, that all of our vaunted lies don't work. And as I said in the last increment, it looks like we go through this phase during the first 364 years of a 490 where we try out, kind of like a kid growing up. You know, when you're a child, you don't know what hot is, you don't know what cold is, you don't know what sweet is, you don't know what sour is, you don't know what good is, you don't know what bad is, and so you try all these things. Like babies play with their poo poo because it's soft and squishy. They don't know that the smell that they're smelling is bad. And they'll put it in their mouth. They don't know any better. So the human race is like a baby. And if you'll notice, you know, 364 years ago, even from now, our standards of what good and bad were were very different from what they are now. Let's see, it's 2015 now. Let's just say 400, round it off. 400 years ago would have been 1615, five years after the Council of Dort. Five years after the Calvinists, and they're arguing with some group they call Pelagians, Five years after they all came to some kind of agree to disagree thing, which at the Calvinist end they call the tulip, the five principles of Calvinism, which are just about as jerky as it gets. Total reversal of the Bible. Every single one of those points. The T, the U, the L, I, and the P. It's like if you reverse what those principles are, then you actually get the Bible. So they reversed the Word of God and called themselves holy for doing so and couldn't even tell that that's what they were doing. And then their flip side arguers, which they call Arminians, see Calvinists haven't grown up since 1610, they're still arguing as if they were living in 1610. Well, the Armenians said they held that man contributed to his own salvation because his decision was a free will choice to believe in Christ, and so man merits something because he chooses to believe. Seriously? So who's crazier, the Calvinists or the Armenians? That was 400 years ago. 400 years ago, there were a whole lot of really stupid people out there, too. You know, the Catholics, of course, they're just as dumb today, just like the Calvinists, just like a lot of Armenians today. You contribute to your own salvation because you believe in the person who paid for your sins? Hello? You're doing a good deed to believe in Christ? You're doing something? Does your mind even function at all? Or are you on crack? It's because of the merit that he did that you believe. There's no merit in your believing. Duh! Oh, well, 
400 years ago. They didn't know that. You can't believe how many people died in wars and fighting between the Calvinists, the Armenians, and the Calvinists. Yeah, and they're all tired of fighting now 400 years later. So we're not bludgeoning each other with axes or tearing up each other's Bibles. That's why there's so few scraps or the Bibles we got surviving are scraps because everybody was tearing up everybody else's Bibles believer against believer that was the standard 400 years ago it was also the standard 400 years ago that if you were accused by somebody that somebody should bound you hand and feet and throw you in the river and if you sank you were guilty That goes all the way back to Hammurabi. He was the first guy, as far as we know in history, who came up with that. Does that sound anything like the Bible to you? No, of course not. But God's name was slapped on it. Trial by combat. That was another big one. 400 years ago, trial by combat. If you were accused and... and you wanted to prove your innocence but you didn't have enough information you insisted on trial by combat and the idea of trial by combat was if you won you were innocent what kind of a cock the nonsense is that and don't even get me started on all the idiot ideas that the Jews had back then that's when the Zohar was invented 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 the Zohar is an invention. I know all these Jews today say that it's true. Honey, it was invented back then. Somebody made it up. And then slapped Moses' name on it. You're going to fall for that? Are you too dumb to live or what? Of course, that's when the letters that we use for the Hebrew Bible were also invented to make the Bible difficult to read so you never learn what it actually says. So notice, we're not doing that now. We thought that was good and right and holy and true then. And it's true that remnants of all that nonsense have survived, but not very strongly. Doesn't it sound laughable now? Yeah, because it took the whole human race a whopping 400 years to wake up and decide, oh gee, you know what, it's not really a great idea if I walk on a level field with an axe and some metal, hot metal covering my head straight at this other guy who's walking toward me on a level field and he's got an axe and I've got an axe and we're gonna both swing at the metal on our heads so if the axe doesn't kill you the metal in your head is gonna kill you because it's gonna bend and as it bends it hits your head because it's already close fitting to your head so now your own helmet kills you not the other guy Hello. Does any of this ring a bell? And of course, back then, 400 years ago, all that stuff was considered high and noble and worthy and holy. Of course, back in 1610, 615, 1615, just when the Re Reformation was really getting underway. It started about well, let's see, technically it started with Gutenberg. It really didn't start with um, Luther in 1517. It really started with Gutenberg when he first made the first printing press. Because that first made the Bible available to everybody. Well, everybody could afford to buy one. But the cheaper, it got a lot cheaper to buy one then. More reliable too. But let's go back 200 years prior, 1415, just before Gutenberg. All those same idiocies I was talking about were still up, still considered to be holy. They were still considered to be holy because man's ability to fight war 
a man's ability to beat up the other guy was limited by his technology. And between 1415 and 1615, there were huge advances in technology. And between 1615 and 1815, there were even bigger advances in technology. And from 1815 until now, wow, you can press a button and wipe out the world if you want. As we advance in our ability to wipe each other out, we got tired of the idea. We started realizing, well, hey, what am I beating myself up for and beating you up for? But you know what? It took 16 centuries. Some would argue 18 centuries. Because World War I essentially started like with the Treaty of Westphalia. If I were to really trace the origin of World War I, I'd go back that far. Because Napoleon was trying to really essentially do the same thing that Alexander was doing. Okay? And it's only because he lost out that there was any kind of rest. But then man's technology improved and we started it up all over again. And it's only because we're too tired now that we're not doing it now. There's a world war coming within the next 10, 20 years. We can't stand living with that one for too long. But that's the point. We have to beat ourselves up. It took 18 friggin' centuries before we had enough capacity to war to create a world war. Before we started to realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe I don't want to do this. So mankind is his capacity for silliness, his capacity for wanting to believe a lie, is extreme. And the slowness with which he finally learns the truth and comes to grips with it is also extreme. And here you are, human, just like everybody else. Where do you want to go? Now the happy news with all this sadness is that you and I as believers, because we're weak, because we're slow, because we're small, because God wants to do this thing with freedom, if we learn Him instead of going the way of the world, which isn't a direction in the world of essentially bad so much as divorce morality, if we don't go in that direction, God will bless the world so it will be harder for the world to go to war in the name of morality. Every war that's ever been started, every war that's ever been fought has always been in the name of morality. My people versus your people. And then God's name gets slapped on my people. And your people are of the demon. That trend, that slapping, that argument, that game has never changed and is no different today. But we can't fight today. So if you and I as Christians today in our integration process say no to divorced morality, then those who are divorced from God in the name of morality will stay weak enough. That was why there was a flood. Now is it true that this trend of being weak follows only at the end of a 490 like it seems to be right now. I don't know. What I've tried to do is I've, you know, in the genius.xls worksheet, and you know, it's never conclusive, as I tried to plot out the rise and fall of interest in Bible, as far as I can tell, the rise and fall of interest in empire, as much as I can tell. 
the rise and fall of religious attempt to control so that they can confiscate Bibles or what do you want to call it? Have a monopoly over how God is interpreted. I tried to document those trends from the cross forward. But there's a lot more information I left out. I tried to document all the rise and fall of big religion trends. But, you know, I left a lot out. It seems as though every 200 years, interest in Bible goes full circle. It goes from, if it was high the last time, then it ends on a high. If it was low the last time, then it ends on a low. And Or it goes from low to high and ends on a high and starts on a low. About every 200 years. If that's so, then the first 364 years are, are mankind as a whole wanting to build toward empire versus wanting to go and learn God. And then the crowd that wants to learn God hits an ebb about 200 years in. So the last 100 or so years of a 364 period ends up with the people wanting to build empire and be divorced morality, winning. And then because they're winning and because they're getting their power and because they're succeeding, they all want to fight with each other over who's top dog. And then the last 126 years or so of 490 are spent with those people all fighting over who's top dog, which causes everybody who had gotten on that bandwagon to start rethinking whether that's really the right bandwagon to be on. And a whole bunch of them decide, you know what, I'm going to look up to God. And then it starts all over again. Now, is that really the cycle? It seems to be from the cross forward. Was that the cycle prior? I can't tell. And it's easy to dispute the results that I'm coming with after the cross, too. Because how do you know if the kind of information that I'm using as benchmarks is really correct to use? And is it really illustrating the, the trend the way I'm saying? That's debatable, really debatable. What I'm looking for is some kind of proof in the Bible of a genetic uh, or a meter that tells you the trend. And I've talked about that off and on. We might have proof of it, at least what the Bible says about it in Genesis 1, but I'm not sure if I'm reading it right. Now, in any event, wherever it is we are, If it's true that the last 126 years of 490 are occupied with this trend toward world empire and people fighting for it and realizing it doesn't work, if that's where we are now, then your vote to learn and live on Bible is more important than normal. Because that will make the transition and the save lives you know, make life more comfortable, get rid of the conflict sooner and all that. If, by contrast, we're entering into a new empire-building phase, and we might be because I might have misgaged the measurements of the 490, considering what Paul wrote, because Paul dates it from Christ's birth. I was dating it from his death. If that's the case, then at this point in history, we're just entering into a climax of, a, of an attempt to empire build, which means we're running into a world war phase, another one. If so, then your vote is more important because of that. So either way, your vote is more important for staving off war, or your vote is more important because we've just come off a war cycle, which was, you know, World War II and the Cold War. Take your pick. But for you yourself, which would you rather have anyhow? Integration with God or a divorce morality where you pound your chest and say how good you are?
which sounds more attractive. Peace out.